Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Thank you for joining the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston. History is so important in understanding the context of many of the social challenges that we currently face. And much attention has been given to uh, women and girls and children uh, recently, and particularly the, the whole issue of human trafficking. And so today I am really excited that we're gonna explore some of these issues, even though we're looking at it in an in international context. Uh, welcome to the Empowerment Zone. I am your host, Ramona Houston, and today we're gonna to talk about this great book, it's uh, newly released, The Persistence of Slavery and Economic History of Child Trafficking in Nigeria. And this is the book, and uh, we have our guest today, uh, Robin Chapdelaine, uh, who is the author of that book. And like myself, she is a historian. So I can't wait to talk to a fellow colleague and historian. Dr. Robin P. Chapdelaine is an assistant professor in uh, the history department at Duquesne University. Her teaching focuses on Africa, child slavery, human trafficking, and migration. Her new book is entitled The Persistence of Slavery, An Economic History of Child Trafficking in Nigeria, and it was released in uh, January 2021. She is interested in understanding how the historical legacies of trafficking provide insight into the phenomenon today. So welcome, Dr. Chapdelaine. How are you today? Fine. Thank you very much, Dr. Houston, for having me. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm excited to talk about my work in uh, universities at large. Yes, well, welcome to the Empowerment Zone. I'm always excited when we have scholars on our show who've actually done uh, quite a bit of research on a particular topic and can really give our audience uh, insight on um, current issues. I'm one of those people uh, that believe that uh, many times uh, scholars live in our intellectual fishbowls on campuses and we don't get out and give the information to the people. And thus, uh, uh, that is one of the reasons that I wanted to uh, create this podcast, The Empowerment Zone. And I'm just really happy that you would join us here today in order to uh, give this information, uh, uh, more information about your scholarship and mm -hmm. how uh, we can use this information today to really address many of the social issues that uh, we are yeah, actually experiencing nowadays. So before we get into that great book uh, that you have just written, can you give us a little information and background about who you are and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. You can give us some personal and professional information, just uh, your hobbies, you know, just tell us about who Dr. Robin is. Sure, thank you so much. Um, so I grew up in the Bay Area in California, San Jose for most of my life. I attended Santa Clara University, um, but my trajectory for school was a bit circuitous because I started school, I stopped, I got married, I had children, and then I went back when my mm. children were uh, relatively young. Um, and then once I graduated from Santa Clara, I decided that I was going to go to graduate school and landed in New Jersey for about 10 years at Rutgers, mm. where I, I did my PhD in women's and African history. Um, I have to tell you that I love the East Coast. I love living in New Jersey. Everybody always wondered why I would leave California <laughs> to go to New Jersey. But it is true that at the time, and quite possibly still, they have one of the uh, best women's and gender programs um, in terms of getting a PhD. So I was delighted to have received my education there. Um, and then from there, I went on to a visiting professorship position at Denison in Granville, Ohio for a couple of years. And then right after that in 2016, I landed in a tenure track position at Duquesne, 
where I teach, as you mentioned, African history courses, human trafficking, human rights courses. Um, I'm just finishing a course on the history of children in childhood, which takes a global approach to the histories of children from Latin America, Latin American to US American, Japanese histories, children's histories of Egypt, um, et cetera. So I think it's important, at least for my students to get a really broad understanding that children and the history of children can't be defined in one particular way. Mm. And it, for the most part, one could argue that childhood itself is a construction and it really depends on the specific time and place of a child mm. um, and knowing that history to understand the processes, the life ways of that community and culture. Um, so I say all that to say that I, I really appreciate my journey. It wasn't always easy, as you could imagine, um, going through a PhD program with or without children, um, but I am glad to have landed where I am now. Um, and I really enjoy not only my own personal work, but student engagement and teaching them about things that I care about. Wow, you're the first person I've met that actually studies the history of children, um, mm -hmm. which is a very unique topic. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that, it, t tell us about that, that, that your entry into the uh, studying that particular topic. Absolutely. Um, so while I was an undergraduate school, I had a professor named Dr. David Skinner. He was an Africanist, he was an East Africanist. So my interest in history at large began at um, the university there. And unlike other, in, uh, other colleges and other universities, I was able to specialize in African history primarily um, with a minor in anthropology. So by the time I got to Rutgers, I knew that I wanted to study the continent. Um, I had a pretty good, I wanted to study West African history. And it was through taking a class with one of the professors at Rutgers that I learned about the 1929 Women's War in Nigeria. This protest happened in 1929, as I mentioned, but it was a culmination of issues that had um, been building up for women in Southeastern Nigeria's, Nigerians in the preceding years. We also know that we're on the cusp of the Great Depression at that time. There was a lot of economic insolvency. We um, know through the historical record that people were suffering from onerous tax responsibilities through the colonial system and just the lack of funds to pay for those taxes. So, as I was learning about this, um, I read an article by Judith Van Allen, who wrote an article called Sitting on a Man and argued that the women's protest was a um, normative way for women to uh, sh share their grievances with society, um, in particular, the grievances against the native court abuses, the warrant chief abuses, and they wanted their demands to be heard um, and they wanted redress. What I couldn't understand was why the number, the thousands of women joined. It is clear that women were traders, they were deeply engaged in the local economy there, they were suffering from increased export, uh, or, pardon me, increased import prices, so the goods that they would buy and increased um, or, and decreased profits from what they were exporting. Um, I already mentioned the taxation, uh, but I still wasn't convinced that that was all that was happening, right? There, there was an economic issue, but there had to be more. Be more. I felt mm -hmm. as if there had to be more. And so after reading Judith Van Allen's article and other articles related to the same historical moment, I decided to go through the over 1,000 pages of inquiry testimony hmm. that occurred in the aftermath of the women's uprising um, in January and the months that followed into 1930. And I found that in almost every instance, women was, were saying, yes, it is the increased um, uh, export, decreased you know, profits that we are getting from our goods, 
but it is also that we are pawning our children in order to pay colonial taxes. Mm -hmm. And when we pawn our children for, you know, the benefit of receiving a, a temporary loan, we expect to get our children back after a certain amount of time. Now, the way the pawning worked in um, this part of the world, it was a long-standing tradition to pawn, whether it be your land, your nephew, your younger brother, or your children. The pawn him or herself, their labor would pay the interest on the loan, but not the loan itself. So the debtor still had to pay the capital back in order to redeem the individual. What nefarious money lenders would do, would they, they would sell the children into the slave market, right? Or offer a girl as a young bride um, in lieu of a payment um, that some might call a bride price, other might be called selling her um, as a slave. And so recognizing these patterns in the testimony, that is what shifted my focus from the women in the women's war to the children as part of money lending systems, an integral part to the colonial economy, and eventually shifted my general interest towards larger matters that have to do with children globally. That's an interesting trajectory into um, the study of uh, children and uh, child slavery. So mm -hmm. tell us about this book. Give us, give us a, a, a great synopsis of the book, what your mission and vision is. It's always a mission and vision, right? Behind the book. What are sure. you, what are you wanting your, your readers to take away from reading this, uh, this book? Sure, absolutely. Um, I want my readers to appreciate the text as a history of people that it's not meant to sensationalize. It's not meant to demonize. It's meant to shed light on true histories of individuals that suffered severe economic insolvency. And they were doing their best in terms of economic strategy to survive in the colonial period, to provide for the remaining children when they did have to pawn out a child. Um, but also many of these individuals, women and men, they were of entrepreneurial spirits. So they always intended to figure out a way to make the funds to redeem children. Um, in no way should the readers take away, the, the message should not be that they did not care, that Southeastern Nigerians did not care about their children because they do. Um, to back up a little bit, to, to reiterate, the book was based off my dissertation. Um, and whenever you rewrite your dissertation to develop it into a larger audience, you have one or two choices. You can write it for a purely and highly ac academic audience, or you can make it a bit more accessible to everyday contemporary readers. And I've mm -hmm. chosen the second. That's good, um, or at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I agree. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, the first part has to do with the accessibility to students to be able to use it in the classroom, um, not just for professors to engage with, but also the general public, people who are concerned about human rights issues, human trafficking, individuals that are interested in, in phenomena that is happening outside of the United States. Um, and then also for people who are interested in histories that um, engage with labor histories, um, economic and trade histories from the pre-colonial era onwards to see how a lot of these patterns of engaging in each of those three themes, what stays the same or, or the trajectory, the, the lineage of those interactions between people when it comes to economics, trade, and labor. Um, and we can see that in the book from um, the pre-colonial period onward. I think that one of the other main points that I would love um, if my readers were interested in and, and appreciated was my emphasis on the history of marriage. 
gender and social relations generally in uh, southeastern Nigeria with specific attention to um, Nigerian patterns of living. Often we understand the continent um, as one place with, with shared patterns and habits, but it is a very heterogeneous place on earth um, with you know, dozens and dozens of countries, thousands of languages and dialects. It is diverse, it is beautiful, it is um, filled with various forms of wealth and up and rising metropoles, right? We should understand each and every country in its own right. And I think that my readers would really appreciate um, learning about the history. And then in the last chapter, I bring the reader to the contemporary period and talk about what is going on in the country right now with regards to um, child trafficking. So it's important to learn about the history of child trafficking in Nigeria, but not center our only understanding about the country in that regard, that there's mm -hmm. all of these other wonderful things that are happening. Um, and then finally, with regards to my book, I have a, a general theory that I pose um, and I want individuals to think about understanding contemporary forms, even in the US in terms of child trafficking in this way. My um, theory, uh, I've entitled it The Social Economy of a Child. And I argue that my book, um, The Persistence of Slavery, offers, offers this framework as a way to understand a child's economic positionality in society. So it's an ideology that asserts that children are valued as kin, laborers, and as protected agents, uh, or rather dependents, pardon me. Yet they're also used as collateral in a variety of ways when parents or gar guardians suffer from economic insol insolvency. Um, and that ultimately children are vehicles through which wealth is transferred. Mm -hmm. They are not solely items of exchange themselves. It is what their embedded and gendered meaning is as uh, a child within families. Um, I know, I, I believe I said last, but I think there's one other point that's really important. In this moment where there are so many ideas about child trafficking, who's at the center of it, um, what causes it, I think it's really important to avoid falling victim to some of these conspiracy theories that have been prevalent in this last year or so. Take seriously children as um, agents of their own uh, existence, their futures, first and foremost. Um, don't let certain news cycles cloud your ability to think critically, which is so important in terms of understanding child trafficking. Um, and be aware that all claims of child trafficking are not true. Right, not all forms of child labor um, are onerous, um, hurtful forms for children. And we need to think about that in a, a global context, right? When people have such limited, limited ways of earning incomes, that doesn't mean that all forms of child labor are okay or that I'm um, advocating for increased child labor uh, uh, instances um, or environments rather. So it really is important to do the research when you are hearing about these instances of child trafficking, thinking critically, dig for more information um, from a variety of sources. Um, and then finally, if you do feel compelled to act in a way that is part of a larger effort in anti-trafficking movements, um, you need to do just as much research about those organizations as well and see what their aim is in terms of identifying and help, uh, helping um, potential victims. Um, it may not be not, you know, it may not be enough to just donate to an organization um, 
perhaps you want to do some training and there's some great training programs out there um, and I'd be happy to list them on my website um, where people can recognize potential victims, who they should call if they suspect trafficking. Um, you know, I highly discourage anybody trying to intercept or accost anybody who seems like a trafficker themselves, right? Um, you don't wanna put yourself in harm's way. But in that way, you can begin to help, pos help within positive efforts, um, meaningful efforts to stop trafficking. Um, and I think that, you know, one way of entering or, or having an entry point into understanding trafficking itself and, and perhaps getting involved is, is to go through the book um, and really understand some of the human behaviors that, um, that are prevalent and that can be recognized uh, as ways to identify and understand traffickers. Um, thank you for uh, listing all of those uh, insights that you hope readers will get out of the book. I'd like you to clarify uh, something for our audience in terms of you uh, talked about the social economy of a child and your theory on that. And one of the things you stated is that <clears throat> all child labor might not be trafficking labor because mm -hmm. of... Um, I'm assuming that you mean because of differences of culture, right? Mm -hmm. That the cultural context in which children operate are differently and we can't impose our culture on other uh, cultures. Can you expand upon that if that is what you were saying? But why, why, why should, in other words, because we are socialized in this culture, mm -hmm. we think that it's inhumane to have child labor. But from what you're stating and what you state in the book, that is actually not always trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, that it, so anyway, I just want you to expand upon that idea so that our audience can get some clarification on that. Right, absolutely. Um, I appreciate that question. First, there is a difference between tra trafficking, human trafficking, where a person is held by force, they are threatened with harm, um, if they want to leave. Child labor can be easily defined by any task that a child does, um, maybe in a repeated way, perhaps for um, remuneration. Sometimes the two get conflated um, erroneously, and sometimes a child can be trafficked for the purpose of child labor, which we have seen globally. And those are true instances um, there are, you know, what, you know, the United Nations and other called the quote unquote worst forms of child labor, the inter international efforts are trying to stop for very good reason. Um, they're a danger to the child, they might stunt growth, they might be pro prone to injury, depending on what the acti activity is. Those kinds of, those forms of child labor um, should absolutely be halted. Then there are other forms of child labor where children are helping parents perhaps on a farm seasonally. They're part of subsistence societies. Um, they may not be able to go to school because their family needs their labor um, for their local farm in order to survive certain um, seasons of the year. What might be helpful if I brought it back to the US in the US context, there is a history of children acting and performing in Hollywood, right? But there are many years where there are no labor laws defining or limiting the number of hours. Um, over time, there were some that were implemented. There are also many children, let's use the age of 18 because it's our, our legal age here in the US, where Children wake up at four or five o'clock in the morning to work on the farm, milk mm -hmm. the cows, mm -hmm. you know, um, flip the hay for horses or whatever's happening. I've mm -hmm. never worked on a farm, so I'm just kind of <laughs> grasping here. Mm -hmm. But I do know that it's true that a child could work from the age of six till they move out of the house in households like that, where the number of hours put in um, 
also depending on the season, could number, you know, in the hundreds uh, every month, if not more. Um, so I think it's really easy for us as individuals who live in the United States to pass judgment on other countries. And we don't mm -hmm. recognize what's happening here in our mm -hmm. own mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. But very few people would argue that working on a family farm or, you know, children who work um, within the entertainment industry, in industry or ch children choirs or anything like that would be some of the worst forms of labor, right? So th that is the kind of distinction that I'm making, um, but not limited to, there are many other examples. Um, I believe we just need to be careful and thoughtful about how we use our words to um, classify and perhaps judge others. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. I, I think that's important. And I like the analogy that you made in terms of how young people may work on the farm and how we don't judge that, but we may judge other cultures in the way they operate. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, uh, in terms of your book, um, looking at what's going on today in our society and uh, we have a lot of activists dealing with issues of women and girls and also with children. Uh, what, uh, what can uh, activists take away from this book and what can they learn from this book that would want them to uh, go and purchase the book to learn more about the historical context of some of the social challenges we're facing today? Right, thank you. I believe that my book provides a model of a written history that leans back to a period where some of the legacies of even the transatlantic slave trade can be seen mm -hmm. um, and replicated in part throughout history to instances of uh, trafficking today in Nigeria. There is not a direct lineage, right? There's not a practice that occurred over and over and over again, unchanged until today, but rather there are some attributes, there are some um, even routes where children have been trafficked um, that in the 1920s and 30s remain the same as those that were used during the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. Um, the, so thus the book provides a roadmap on how a contemporary moment can be better understood by knowing a region's history. So um, whether it would it be in um, throughout the Mediterranean or East Africa or instances in Asia and perhaps even the US um, and especially the relationship between um, Latin America and the US the history of migration, the history of colonization in the Americas, all of that feeds into us better understanding the movement of people, right? And smuggling mm -hmm. is another word that is distinct from, but sometimes related to traffic instances mm -hmm. of trafficking. Mm -hmm. If you really understand why people are moving, to put simply, you have to, take the time and invest in the individual histories of that mm -hmm. movement. So mm -hmm. usually you have to start with a relationship between two countries or the specific political and social history of that region. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Empowerment Zone and sharing your book, The Persistence of Slavery. I encourage uh, my audience to uh, pick it up and um, uh, really learn uh, about the not only the history of slavery and in uh, economics and child uh, child labor history and um, the history of trade. Uh, but also to learn a little bit about one of the many countries in Africa. <laughs> I don't know why we always try to group them all together, but to learn more about the history of Nigeria, one aspect mm -hmm. of Nigerian history. So thank you for sharing your book with us, but you also have another project 
uh, that you're working on that I'd like you to share with our audience. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, I had no intention of uh, becoming an editor of a, an edited volume um, so soon after the publication of this book. But in, I believe it was just February that I was on a Zoom call with three other women of color, three other black women. Um, my heritage is Mexican-American and African-American. Um, we, were, we were on this call basically as a support call, you know, checking in academically, how are our classes going? How are all of our writing projects going? And each of us were talking about the successes that we've had in the last um, year or so. Uh, or last two years, you know, um, getting tenure or publishing a book or getting a new job. But all of the kind of emotive experiences that we were um, expressing, that we were saying that we were successful in all of these ways, but there was no clear expression of joy or excitement or, <laughs> you know, patting ourselves on the back. And somebody said that about, someone explicitly said that on the call about um, she was waiting for the joy to come. And I was like a jack in the box, you know, I was like, oh, I gotta have an idea. <laughs> I said, we should edit a collection of volume written by black women and the title should be when will the joy come wow um black women in the ivory tower and the win was in parentheses and it was within two weeks you know we wrote a report a proposal we sent it to the publisher um they loved it they loved the idea gave us an advanced contract and now we've just gone through um, submitting all of our acceptance letters to the contributors. We hope to have the first drafts of those chapters. But the reason why this is significant, we framed it uh, chronologically in terms of we are in the, um, the midst of the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd we have experienced uh, a rise in um, tweets in the Black and the Ivory Tower, right? So a lot of Black uh, men and women have contributed to painful experiences as people in the academy who are not treated equally or with equity, without respect um, by both their colleagues and uh, their students and at times their administration. This is harmful to individuals. They love, we love our jobs. We love the intellectual engagement. We like the human relationships that we build on campus. However, when our identity is shaping the way by which other individuals in the academy are treating us, um, their expectations, their assumptions about our work, it's highly problematic and it's damaging. So rather than uh, develop a volume that is filled with just complaints about our experiences, we decided to think about how we can celebrate our intellectual abilities our intersectional identities, our personhood as people, as women of color in the academy um, in various ways, whether it is um, seeking out mentors, whether it is developing networks, whether it is in itself the writing of quantitative um, sociological work to show that this is happening, that in itself could be a healing process as well as, or, you know, including many other ways in which um, individuals who have suffered these assaults um, find healing and, and moments of joy. In other words, we've realized that we have to create it for ourselves. The academy, the academy was not built for us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just the fact. 
um, but we can, through a variety of coming together and networking, build a space where we find equity, where we find joy and, and continue the passion for our work. I love it. Um, you know, it's interesting that you stated you all um, are creating a space so that women in the ivory tower can celebrate ourselves and each other, right? Uh, because we're definitely, or excuse me, let, let me not say definitely, we rarely uh, receive um, the type of affirmation that we should receive in, the, in, in higher education. Because as you stated, the academy was not built uh, for uh, people of color or women and particularly women of color. <laughs> and right. so um, I, it's funny, I, it's interesting in that I just had a conversation with another scholar who's doing some work for African-American women on historically, uh, uh, on the campuses of historically black colleges and universities. So there's definitely a need, as we say, to celebrate women and our contributions, particularly women of color, uh, but also figure out how can we support one another's work and affirm one another's work and then celebrate each other's work. Um, just to give a personal experience, when I finished my um, exams for my dissertation, and after, you know, how it is in history, we have to read 200 plus books and, you know, all that. So I finished my exam and uh, after it was over, I was like, this is it. I mean, you know, I just walked out of the room. They said, you passed. And it was like, this is it. That's what I was thinking to myself. You know, like I did all of that and there's no celebration. I mean, what, you know, I don't feel like I've, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel like I had this major achievement. And so what I decided personally, I said, okay, from now on for the rest of my life, because I come from a very supportive family, mm -hmm. for every time I have an achievement, we're going to celebrate. And so that's what I, I did, you know, so at my dissertation defense, my whole family was at my dissertation defense from five different it. states, I you know, it. and now when um, I have various speaking engagements or clients or whatever. Soon as it's over, my mom has some kind of treat, you know, it's <laughs> outside with wine and chocolate, you know. Uh, I so I, you, I found a way in the, as an individual to do it. But what a pleasure it is to have, to create a space where we can do it collectively, you know. Absolutely. And so I, I commend you uh, for not only the vision, but actually implementing the vision. Like a lot of times we have ideas, but we don't go through with them. So right. I commend you for that. So can you repeat the name of the volume again, uh, or what, what you are currently naming it until it is publicized so that we can be looking forward to uh, checking Absolutely. it out? Absolutely. Um, so it is called, When Will the Joy Come? Black Women in the Ivory Tower, and uh, we hope to have it out with the University of Massachusetts Press. Um, it may be a year or so, but it's gonna come to fruition. And let me tell you, as you could imagine, there were more proposals than we could include. Um, people want their stories heard, and it's not because individuals are complaining or whining. There is, an issue in higher education. And there are so few of us in each of our institutions that this kind of interaction, this kind of coming together um, to produce a comprehensive effort is in itself a way for individuals to connect, heal, and absolutely, I would argue, produce something that can be used as a tool for up and coming scholars, up and coming black women scholars, women of color scholars. Um, and as my husband put it, 
He said, this is like a chicken soup for your soul, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for um, junior academics, all the way up to senior academics and those who are in, in administrative positions. Um, and I hope that it is. I really hope that it is. I love it. When will the joy come? Black women in the ivory tower. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we look forward to uh, hearing about it when it's published. You're welcome back. You and <laughs> anybody else you want to bring with you uh, awesome. once you publish it, to, we welcome you back to the uh, Empowerment Zone to discuss it uh, when it Thank is you. published. Um, like I said, you can bring the whole crew if you'd like. I will. Uh, <laughs> that would be a sure. great conversation. <laughs> um, and I do want to say that you know, even though you couldn't accept everybody, hey, we can, uh, there's always room for volume two, three, four, five, and uh, just to continue on, uh, to continue this discussion until we really reach a place where um, we don't have these challenges. Uh, and Absolutely. so, but until then, we want to celebrate each other. We want to support one another and most definitely we want to affirm each other's work. So congratulations on, on, um, on that particular uh, project. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it was such a pleasure having you, Dr. Robin. Thank you so much for joining on us on the Empowerment Zone and we look forward to having you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. We have Dr. Robin Chapdelaine here, uh, and she's going to give us a strategy for college success. Dr. Robin, um, before you give us your strategy, can you tell us what school or schools did you attend? Mm -hmm. What was your major? And then what is that one strategy that you would give students to make sure that they are successful in college? Absolutely. I attended Santa Clara University in California. I received my BA in African history with a minor in anthropology. I attended Rutgers University for my PhD in women's and gender and African history. With regards to strategies for success, I think that there are two key uh, approaches uh, that students should consider. Number one, look for your mentors in a variety of spaces. It's not always going to be your academic advisor. It won't always be the career counselor. Um, wherever you feel most comfortable forming and cultivating relationships with people on campus, you might find that even someone who doesn't look like you, right, who may not be interested in the same kind of educational um, subjects is you. They may be the individual to help encourage you, to help you strategize. Um, and then I, I'm saying this with specific regard to what we've experienced with COVID in student populations. For students who go, who have gone through the last 12 plus months in quarantine, what I have seen is that a lot of them suffer from depression, anxiety, the dislocation from their classroom has had a profound effect. Um, in terms of strategy, do not hesitate to get therapy. Don't underestimate the power of reaching out if you need help. Um, I think those kinds of emotional strategies are just as important as educational strategies. Um, and so I think those are two of the ways that I think people can, can find success in their academic careers. Thank you so much, Dr. Robin, for that great advice. Um, identify a mentor or mentors, but look for them in different places. They don't necessarily always have to be uh, within your major or field. They don't always have to be the counselor. It, that You can find mentors in various places on campus. So make sure that you explore uh, when you attempt to identify a men mentor. And then mm -hmm. secondly, make sure you take care of your mental health. People are always talking about that freshman 15, which I got it. Uh, <laughs> freshman 20, I think mine was a 25. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's not just physical health, but you also have to really address your mental health. And there are so many resources on campus that can help you with the various emotional, me- mental challenges that you may have on, uh, uh, on as you matriculate through college. So make sure that you tap into those resources and take care of your mental health. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Robin. We appreciate that advice. You're welcome. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone. Terry Gully, theme song, NADWorks, digital support, and of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.